Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this video we're going to be looking at exercise number five from Interpreting Earth History by Ritter and Peterson. All right, so you will find uh, exercise number five starting on page, so do excuse me, give me one moment just to find the right page, there it is, starting on page 59. And you can see that this particular lab focuses on stratigraphy and you can see just like all the other exercises we have a purple box telling you the objectives and we have some introductory information now this particular exercise has an absolutely lovely set of descriptions about lithostratigraphy biostratigraphy and chronostratigraphy so if you're willing to take the time and i would strongly advise it pages 59 60 61 62, 63, 64 are full of very helpful information which will make your lives much, much easier when you come to do the labs. I, I really can't recommend it enough. They've really gone to town when it comes to these particular uh, paragraphs and they've done a really great job describing the differences between the three types of stratigraphy. Okay, so let's start with part A. So part A is going to focus on lithostratigraphy. So as you can see on page 64, we have the stratigraphic column. All right, and you can see it comes all the way down to the bottom here. So we have a sandstone down here at the bottom coming all the way up to the top there. Okay, so what's, what's our job? Well, the first thing we need to do is, based on your analysis of the column, subdivide the rocks in the column into formations. Now... A formation can be a single layer of rock or it can be more than one layers of rock. And essentially a formation is a unit that geologists use to make our lives easier. So, you know, so if you walk up to a cliff face, there can be dozens of rock units in a in the in dozens of rock units on the cliff face. So what a geologist will do is it will try and split those rock units into groups, which we call formations. And it just makes our lives easier. So rather than talking about a, you know, two or three dozen rock units, we can split them up into maybe one or two formations. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at this stratigraphic column and we're going to try and split it up into formations. Now, just to make just to show you something, as long as to make it clear, you'll notice there are a few U's on the stratigraphic column, they represent unconformities. So if you remember, an unconformity is an erosional surface. Now, one of the things about formations is a formation must have a distinct upper and lower boundary. So I'm just actually going to bring the camera in a little bit here. Oh, I'm also going to knock it about, sorry. And I'm just going to adjust the focus once again, if you'll excuse me for just a second. Okay. So if we have a look at the stratigraphic column here, what we can see, for instance, is this unit here, nice sharp lower contact, nice sharp upper contact. This unit here, obviously sharp lower contact, sharp upper contact. This unit here, nice sharp upper contact. Okay. Now, then if we look at other parts of the sequence, so for instance, if we start looking at these rocks up here, you'll notice how, you know, these rocks here are all kind of mixed together. There's no nice well-defined contact so if we look at this little limestone layer here it kind of blends in between this mudstone here the limestone there and back into the mudstone or the sandy mudstone here so there's no nice sharp contact so what we want with our formations is we want there to be a nice sharp well-defined contact and that's typically either a sharp boundary a sharp bending plane or an unconformity Unconformities are one of the classic sharp surfaces that allow us to define formations. So how are we going to split up our stratigraphic column? Well, first of all, I'm just going to pull the camera up here a little bit. Sorry, guys, just going to make a one or two minor adjustments there. Okay, stop that camera from shaking, and I'm just going to quickly refocus. Okay, there we go. Okay, so... So... As you can see at the bottom here, they've gone and marked out a couple of formations here. So you can see, for instance, this sandstone here, which they call the uh, Canino sandstone. You'll notice there's a nice sharp boundary there at the top. So that's going to be the upper boundary of that particular formation. 
Now above that we have the kebab limestone. You can see once again nice sharp lower contact, nice sharp upper contact. Now you see then we're coming into this unit. It consists of a mudstone layer, a sandstone layer, and then another mudstone layer. Now the thing you'll notice is when you look at the boundary, sorry, I said sandstone, I meant limestone, sorry. When you look at the boundary of this limestone layer here, you'll notice you don't have nice clean lines. That means the boundary between this sandy mudstone here and this limestone is gradational, and the boundary between this limestone here and this sandy mudstone here is also gradational. So the boundary is not sharp, so we can't use that to essentially as a boundary for our you know, upper or lower limit of our formation. So our formation essentially starts here, and it continues all the way up until we do hit a sharp boundary. And here it is, an unconformity, right there. That's going to be our upper boundary for our formation. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our ruler, and then we're simply going to draw a line marking our boundary of our formation. So you're going to draw a nice line coming across here. Okay. So then you're going to move, so this is the start of our formation here, then we're going to continue up, and then obviously we have a nice sharp boundary here, so that's going to be the next boundary of our formation. So we're going to have another formation that runs from here to here. Okay? And so you're going to split up the stratigraphic column into different formations, and you're probably going to end up with somewhere in the region of about, excluding these two down here, probably anywhere between about 8 and 11 depending on exactly how you split them up. Okay, so the next part, which is part two, is to give your formations names. Now, if your formation just consists of one layer of rock, you will name your formation after that rock. So as you can see, this, lime, this layer here is a limestone, so it's named the Kaibab limestone. If you use this layer of sandstone as just one formation, it would be the something sandstone. You'd use this mudstone as a formation, it would be a, the something mudstone. All right. Now, if, however, your layer consists of multiple different rock types, so here we have a muddy sandstone. Sorry, I need to get the book straight. I do apologize. Here we have a muddy sandstone. Here we have a limestone. And here we have a muddy sandstone again. So we have, you know, at least we have two different rock types here, don't we? This would be the something formation. So if the formation is heterogeneous, so it consists of more than one rock type, it's referred to as a formation. If it's just one rock type, it's simply referred to by the name of that rock. All right, I hope that's clear. Now, in terms of the, the name that you put in front of it, that one is completely up to you. You know, so this could be the JJ Watt formation. This could be the Harden formation, etc. All right, so you can come up with the names, you know, as you see fit. Obviously, one rule is keep them clean, please. So the final part of part A is to uh, produce a list briefly describing the formations. And so if we actually just turn the page for just a second. So it's actually given you some, some basic descriptions here. So for each formation, you're going to do a bullet point. And you're going to name your, you're going to put the name of your formation. So in this case, it's the Kikino uh, sandstone. Then it says, right, what's the grain? So what's it made of? Sandstone. How thick is it? And you know any geologic structures in it. So you know in this case, it's got cross beds. And what does it do? Well, it forms cliffs. So it asks you to note whether your rock layer forms slopes, ledges, or cliffs. So. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. So as we can see in this case, it says the Kikino uh, sandstone forms a cliff, but let's go and see what it says about the uh, Kavab limestone. So the Kavab limestone is a limestone layer. It's got an approximate thickness of 150 feet, and it forms a cliff. So remember, a cliff is just going to be any kind of you know, vertical surface. So we can see in this case here, we have a cliff. We have a cliff here. We have a cliff here, don't we? Now, for instance, this section here this is obviously a slope you can see you've got a gentle gentle slope there then we have another cliff here so when you describe your formations you're going to sometimes have more than one description of exactly what type of you know a surface it forms does it form a ledge does it form a cliff does it form a slope okay so there may be more than one description so note the name the thickness you know whether there are any 
um, obvious sedimentary structures. So for instance, in these sandstones here, you can see these curved lines represent cross beds. Now these thin bands here in the muddy sandstones and the mudstones, they represent laminations. Okay. In terms of this layer up here, you can see it's a bit pebbly. That's going to be a conglomerate layer. So the descriptions don't have to be complicated. Okay. I should also point out that you know the fewer formations you have, the less work it is to do part C. So when you come to splitting up this sequence into formations, don't go mad. You're just making more work for yourself. Okay. So part A is nice and straightforward. So what about part B? Well, part B is normally an exercise that I will do. However, as we are uh, working online here, and most of you have the uh, the online version of the textbook, unfortunately, uh, part B is not something we can do easily. So we're going to dump that. So part B this time will not be uh, done. Okay, so let's move on to part C. All right, part C. Now this is a particular. This is a part of the lab that a lot of people enjoy doing. So. Part C is focusing on biostratigraphy. So it begins to tell us about the red wall limestone in the Grand Canyon. And it starts to tell us that this particular layer contains the remains of several different types of fossils. So things like brachiopods, crinoids, mollusks, arthropods, arthropods bryozoans, etc. Lots of different marine organisms. All right. So we're going to start by looking at figure 5.7. And figure 5.7, which is this diagram here, it shows us a blown up picture of the red wall limestone. So this is the lower margin here, and this is this thick black line, and this is the upper margin here, this thick black line. So this is the red wall limestone there. And you can see it just in context of the larger Grand Canyon here. You can see it for, tends to form these tends to form these large, big, essentially cliff but you know, buttresses that stick out into the Grand Canyon because it's quite a robust layer of rock. Okay, so figure 5.8 shows the occurrence of selected species in samples taken at a 50 foot intervals through the red wall limestone. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark the position of those species onto diagram 5.8b. Okay, so, so here's 5.8 and you can see here are the different fossils we well, can see there are the different fossils should I say okay and these are the locations that they are found at 50 foot intervals so if we look here uh, Michaelena expansa which has already been marked out for us here you can see it occurs at 0 50 100 150 and we can see they made marks in the diagram here at 0, 50, 100, 50. Now they've been kind enough to actually write down the names of each of the fossils here for us, so we, we don't have to even do that. So the next fossil is going to be the, oh, cripes, uh, Granuliferula spinosa, and that occurs at 150 and 200. So just to make my life a little bit easy, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to put a very faint line on the page here. Okay, that's going to help me work out where my crosses should go. And then once again, just to make sure, so they occur at 150 and 200. So 150, so I'm going to put a cross here. Then I'm going to put a cross here at 200. And obviously then I'll erase the line. To, you know, make sure the crosses are much clearer. And that's that. And then on to the next onto the next fossil okay so that's relatively straightforward not much of a challenge there so you're going to fill out this part of the diagram with the information that we have in the fossil chart up here okay good so that's part a or part one should i say so part b so what we're going to do is using the ranges of species that we have just drawn we're going to subdivide the red wall limestone on the right on the, so I'm going to subdivide the red wall limestone on the right hand side of the column on the right hand side into several different range zones. So the range zones we're going to produce are going to be a Polyganthus communis spirifogranulosis range zone, a Endothyra tumula range zone, 
and the Michelena Expanser range zone, which has already been given for us. So what does that mean? Well, these range zones are essentially defined by the first and last appearance of certain key fossils. So let's look at the case of the uh, Michelena Expanser range zone. So here it is. They, they already drew it for us. So this is where Michelena Expanser appears. So it appears at zero and disappears. Well, last appearance is at 150. Sorry, I've got to stop tipping the page. I do apologize. So if we come over here, here's the stratigraphic column. So the Michelena Expanser range zone starts here at zero and goes up to 150 because that is the range in which it occurs. The, the range zone cannot go above 150 because Michelena Expanser does not exist in those layers of rock. So, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a range zone for, where are we? Uh, once again, Polygamphus communis and Spirifer granulosis and Endothyra tumula. Now, Endothyra tumula is just one fossil. Okay. So let's say it occurs between 500 and 300. Well, between 500 and 300, that would be your Endothyra tumula range zone, wouldn't it? In the case of Polygamphus communis and Spirifer granulosus, well, there are two fossils defining that range zone. So think about it. That range zone can only be defined when those two fossils coexist. So please bear that in mind when you're drawing your range zones. It can only be when those two fossils are coexisting together. So as you can see, once you've essentially worked out what your range zone could be, draw a line across and mark out on the column here where the range zone occurs. Okay, so that's part two. Next, it's going to ask you to color each of the range zones a different color on the graphic column. So on the column over here. So I'd color this one blue, you know, this one red, and this one green, maybe. For part four, it says, using the colors that we've adopted for item three, trace the outcrop pattern of the three zones that we defined onto 5.7b. So, oh, would really help if I went the right way. So here's 5.7b. There it is. So we know that uh, the Michelinia Expanser range zone goes from zero to, I think it was 150. I'm having a sudden panic attack. Yes, 150. And so what I would do is I would draw a line, essentially that keeps a constant thickness all the way across here. And that represents the uh, Michelinia Expanser range zone. And I would color that in blue. Then I would do the same for the, uh, what was it, Spirifer granulosis range zone, which I'd cover color red, and then the Endothyra tumula range zone, which I'd color in green. And so you should have three bands of color on this diagram here. Now, one thing I would ask is please try and make them dark colors, because when it comes to you uh, scanning this or taking pictures of this to submit, Typically, uh, lighter colors don't turn up very well. I would also strongly advise not using highlighters because highlighters also don't, uh, <coughs> excuse me, don't uh, appear very strongly when it comes on scanned uh, or photographed images. Sorry, I turned the book the wrong way. Then we're on to part five. So what is the average number of species occurring in each zone? So you're just going to have to count how many species appear in each zone. Okay, so you'll do it for each zone, and then you'll add up the average number of species per zone, divide by three, and that will give you your average number of species. Now, the one thing I will say is, is if we go here, so if we look at this diagram here, so here we have the uh, Michelinet Expanser range zone, starts at zero, goes to 150. Okay, so obviously there's one species that occurs in that range zone, but this species will also occur in that range zone, because note, these two fossils do occur together at the same time. So they would be cons this fossil would also be considered to have occurred within the Michelinet Expanser range zone. Okay, so just bear that in mind. If a fossil falls on the, on, on the boundaries of the range, zo range zone, it's considered to be in that range zone. Okay, so you're gonna come up with a number of fossils for the Michelinet Expanser range zone, another range of fossils for the Spirifer granulosis range zone, and another um, 
another number of fossils for the endothyra tumula range zone. And then you're going to take those three numbers, add them together, divide by three, and that's going to give you your average. Okay. So part six, give an example of a zone in which the name bearing species never occurs outside its zone. So that one's relatively straightforward. Just find, a, find one, of the, one of these four species and find out which one of them doesn't occur outside its zone. Number seven, give an example of a zone in which the name bearing taxa, so that's one of the four species here, occur in another zone as well. So just look to find where one of these one of these organisms you know goes into one of the other zones. And remember, if it falls on the boundary of one of the other zones, it's still considered to be part of that zone. Okay. So part C is a very very straightforward uh, part of the lab, and typically a lot of people quite enjoy doing it. So then we move on to part D. Now part D deals with something which we call graphic correlations and graphic correlations are a tremendously important part of sedimentary geology. They're an extraordinarily helpful tool for geologists. So a graphic correlation, so I'm just going to come to the table down here, takes uh, stratigraphic columns from two locations. So we'll go to two locations and we'll look at the cliff faces. Okay, And what we'll do is we'll note the first and last appearance of certain fossils. Now in this case they're given letters. Okay, So for each fossil at location X, so fossil A at location X appeared 15 meters above datum. Now datum is the the, the point where essentially we start counting from. Alright? So at location X fossil A appeared 15 meters above datum. At location Y fossil A appeared 5 meters above datum. At location X, fossil B occurred 21. At location Y, 14. Now then we also have the, t the, the essentially the height where the fossil is last seen. So fossil, fossil A at location X appears 49 meters above datum. At location Y, it appears 23 meters above datum. So what are we going to do with that information? Well, we're going to plot it onto a graph and produce something that looks like this. So the first appearance for our fossils are drawn as circles and the last appearance are drawn as squares. Okay, so once you draw all the data on, what you're going to do is you're going to put a trend line through and that trend line is going to be very, very helpful to us because what it allows us to do is it allows geologists to work out essentially corresponding layers at different locations. So here's section X. So if I'm interested in this clay layer here at section X, which is about 50 meters or so above datum, and I say, right, I want to know, uh, I want to find a layer of rock at, well, this, I want to find a layer of rock at location Y, which is the same age as this clay layer at location X. And so the way I do it is I draw a line up from 50 meters datum, continue up, until I hit the trend line. Then when I hit the trend line, that's what called the point of correlation. Then I'll come straight across and I will come over to section Y or the Y axis. And this height on location Y is the same age as this height at location X. And so you'll note it's an extremely helpful tool. It helps geologists essentially correlate between uh, layers of rock at different locations. It's a very simple but very very powerful tool. So you will notice that we have three different tables and we also have three questions for D. So one, two and three. So what are we going to do? Well okay so table 5.1a species A occurs X15 Y5. So here's our graph paper okay now the first thing you're going to do for me is you are going to label this table, to apologize, let me just double check, you're going to label this table 5.1a so I know exactly which graph this is. Okay, so as we can see, species A, location X15, Y5. So 
location x. 15 is going to be here. Then I'm going to come up 5 on the y-axis here. So my point's going to be there. Okay. So what about the time when it last appears? Location A last appears at location x, 49, which is going to be here. Location Y, 23, which is going to be there. And so it's going to be 49, 23. So my square is going to go right there. Okay, now please bear in mind, I'm just drawing this very, very roughly. Okay. So that's all you've got to do. Just draw the first and last appearances for each of the fossils. Now, if you are doing this using the online version, you're going to have to take screen grabs of the graph paper and dump it into a program like, I don't know, PowerPoint or, you know, or something like that. And just use the, just dump um, circles and squares at the correct location on PowerPoint. Uh, by the way, if you happen to have uh, your PowerPoint set to snap to grid, so your any square you draw on a diagram will naturally just snap to a you know a set spacing. Hit the Alt key. So press down the Alt key while you're moving the shape, and it will allow you to move it wherever you want. If you don't press down the Alt key, the shape will essentially go to set locations on the image, and you won't be able to control its exact location. So just bear that in mind. If you are using some, if you are using PowerPoint to do this hit the alt key when you're moving the circles and the squares around because that's going to allow you to you know make sure you get a very accurate location okay so you're going to do that for data in table 1a 1b and 1c so table so you've got graph 1a graph 1b and graph 1c so you're going to have three graphs at the end using each of these tables of data and then you simply have to answer these very simple questions so question one Okay, so you're going to plot the graph. What stratigraphic level in section X corresponds to 55 meters in section Y? And so all you're going to do on your first graph is you're going to start at 55 meters at location Y, which is going to be here. You're going to draw your line across until you hit your line of correlation, and then you're going to come down. And you're going to read off the value down here on your X axis. So nice, simple question. Part two. Repeat the plotting procedure in question one for data in table 5.1b. Five, uh, 5 what, what is the explanation for the horizontal part of the line? So what you're going to notice when you plot up your data for 5.1b is you're going to see the data forms two distinct clumps. You're going to get a, essentially approximately, you're going to get a clump of data that falls down here you're going to get a clump of data that falls somewhere up here. Okay, so each of those clumps of data is going to have its own trend line. So you're going to have a trend line for this clump of data and a trend line for this clump of data. Well, that means you, t you have two isolated trend lines, don't you? So what you'll do is you'll join them together using a horizontal line. So there's going to be a horizontal portion to this diagram. You're going to have a trend line, a horizontal line, then another trend line. So the question then becomes is, well, what does a trend line mean? Well, if you think about it, a trend line means that you are, a horizontal line, sorry, would mean that if the horizontal line is orientated this way, okay, it would mean that the amount of sediment at X was going up, but the amount of sediment at Y was not increasing. Okay, so think about it. The trend line being there tells you that the amount of sediment's increasing that way, so at location X, but it's not increasing at location Y. And so there's a, there's a couple of reasons why this could be, and you're going to have to take a few seconds, think about it. You might be able to work it out. If you can't work it out, okay, that's fine. You know, contact me during office hours or send me an email, and I'll try to give you a nudge in the right direction. Okay. And then finally, we go to the wrong page, sorry. Finally, we go to part three. And part three says, repeat the procedure again. What does the pattern of points and line of correlation drawn through the points suggest about the relative sedimentation rates at location X and location Y? 
So okay, so let's say this is our graph here. Well, if we have a trend line that's like this, well that says that the amount of sediment is increasing rapidly at location X, but not very quickly at location Y. If we have a trend line like this, well that tells us the amount of sediment is, lo is increasing rapidly at location Y, but not at location X. And if we have a trend line that's about 50-50, that's going to mean the amount of sediment being deposited at X and Y is approximately equal. So the rate is about the same. So the angle of the trend line is very, very helpful in telling us you know, what the relative rate of sediment deposition is between the two locations. So if we look at the, the diagram that's as part of the text here, you can see this particular trend line, it's about 50-50. And so that would tell us that the amount of sediment being deposited at, at location X would be approximately the same at location Y. All right. Now, finally, we have part E. That's the chronostigraphy question. Once again, unfortunately, because we are using the online version of the textbook, part E is not going to be a particularly easy job for you guys. So let's just skip part E. All right, and then that is it. So for exercise five, you should be doing part A, part C, and part D, and that's it. Okay, everyone, I hope you find hope you found this video relatively clear, and I hope you have a, a good try at doing it. And remember, if you do have problems with it and you can't understand what I'm getting at, you can email me or you can contact me during office hours at the allotted day and time. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.